the sky. But the night would bring no cooling downpour. Instead, torrents of fire would sweep the land. August 24th, 1970. 45 fires burn in the Wenatchee National Forest in North Central Washington, all touched off by a lightning storm during the night. Throughout the morning, forest crews are sent in to circle or attack every fire. With natural lakes abundant in this part of Washington, there is no shortage of water. For Wenatchee officials, these first hours are crucial, for once the sun has had a chance to heat the earth, even the smallest fires can become raging infernos. At 1 p.m., a superheated ground fire, whose temperature has risen to 2,500 degrees, begins sucking in the surrounding oxygen. The more it takes, the more force it builds from within, and so generates its own winds. Firefighters call it a blow-up, one of the most powerful and uncontrollable forces on the face of the Earth. has never found a way to control the force of wildfire. A blow-up, the scientists say, is comparable to the explosion of a 20 kiloton bomb. Its temperatures ultimately rise to 3,500 degrees. Its winds can reach the force of a tornado. following morning, Tuesday, August 25th, 33,000 acres have burned. Fifteen of the initial fires are totally out of control. Each has a different name linked to a geographical starting point. Gold Ridge, Mitchell Creek, Poison Creek, Cougar Mountain, North Tommy and South Tommy, Slide Ridge, and Signal Peak. Yet together, they're part of a single disaster which officials already call one of the worst in the history of the state. A beleaguered national forest must call for help.
From as far away as New Hampshire and Alaska, firefighters converge in Wenatchee. Full-time foresters, Indian specialists, college and high school students. Ultimately, they will number more than 8,500. Many are weary, for already this year, 13,000 fires have attacked the nation's forests. With amazing swiftness, the quiet enclaves of north central Washington have been transformed into staging areas. The solitude of a vacation wilderness has been broken. As if in some distant land, some other place on earth, great machines rend the silence, and young men are led against an enemy. Alter Lake State Park. Until two days ago, this was a quiet camping ground for summer vacationers. In 48 hours, the Forest Service has turned it into a totally self-sufficient city for 2,000 men. Fire boss Don Peters, a career forester with 35 years experience fighting fires, was summoned from his home in Oregon to run all operations out of Alter Lake. His first job, is to try to organize the massive firefighting effort. Uh, Ray, uh, I want to try to give you some help there. And uh, Bob Krell, who was here you know, before we yes. came in, yes. and could I uh, assign him to you and have him help you yes. and kind of throw you off? I appreciate that. All right, well, let's, let's go over now and I'll give a talk to him. Yeah. And, uh, so okay. Because you're getting bogged down with yeah. too many details. Wednesday, August 26th, the effort to circle the fire is pushed, but under a worsening pall of smoke. Atmospheric pressures have formed a ceiling over the fire areas. The smoke cannot escape. The air tankers, which are so heavily relied upon for slowing down the progress of fire, cannot fly. The elements have combined to create a smoke screen which the pilots are unable to penetrate. Beneath the smoke, the fire will continue to move unchecked through the night. Thursday, August 27th. The weather this day, a crazy conspiracy that baffles and frustrates the firefighters. Winds gust up to 40 miles an hour, yet the sickening gray-brown smoke hangs thick, almost obliterating the sun. Summer resorts like Lake Chelan become ghost towns, choked by the smell of burning trees. Fire suppression costs are averaging half a million dollars a day. Mobilization of the firefighting army is almost complete. Thousands of men are out on the lines. 
but their efforts are futile against the driving winds. Fifty-eight thousand acres of timber are burned, nearly six million trees. Now, many of the smaller fires have run together, and three massive burns pose the greatest threat. Mitchell Creek, Gold Ridge, and Entiat. I'd like to bring you up to date on what we've got. Last night, we were a little bit optimistic on what we were going to get, but the uh, public information that we're getting shows that, that on Mitchell Creek, here the, uh, the fire has bulged out. It's gone across Great Creek here. It's giving us a little trouble. We're having a little trouble here. Now, on the rest of the fires, things have changed and changed in a hurry. Gold Ridge, which you may have heard about earlier, and this is as of 1500, 3 o'clock, has broken out of the lines, is going towards the west, towards the town of Ardenbore. The fire is visible on the ridges above Ardenbore, and the people are packing to pull out. Scattered along a narrow, winding road, some 50 homes comprise the isolated lumber town of Ardenbore. The name means a place to see the forest. Relentless fire moves slowly down the slopes of the valley toward Ardenbore's homes and the lumber mill where most of its residents work. Ultimate responsibility for stopping it rests with one man, fire boss Ralph McCurdy. Cut the line in and head around the mountain. Now I got fire over in the rocks in the next row. Yeah, we can see it from here. I've got another spot even further down now. Now, right, here come the choppers, back. We may be a day late and a dollar short on that one. Although the helicopters drop 400 gallons of water, the effect is like isolated raindrops. The fire is too widespread. Visibility remains bad, and throughout the day, bomber drops are too high and too infrequent to be effective. By mid-afternoon, more than 1,300 men have arrived at a base camp set up in Ardenbore's lumber mill. None will rest until the battle is decided. Everything is improvised. The milling pond becomes a helicopter water hole. We got fire going in the, We got a move pretty much moving the other direction towards the west, but uh, right now we're just in a state of flux and. Uh, we don't really have any good uh, good comments. We understand the civil defense did ask uh, that uh, residents in this area water down their houses. Uh, does this mean there's a real danger of this fire coming over the hill? We hope not. We're right, as of right now, we don't expect it to come over. If the weather conditions get severe enough, anything can happen. By 4 p.m., 
The fire is within 200 yards of some homes, and neighbors join in a desperate primitive effort to save those in most immediate danger. Nothing man can do has any effect. The creeping fire maintains its steady pace, burning through the thick undergrowth and gnawing at the roots of trees. Ultimately, heat becomes too intense for the firefighters, and at many places along the Ardenbore Road, they'll be forced to back away. p.m. With no relief in sight, some residents prepare to evacuate their homes. Mrs. Goldman, what are you feeling right about now? I'm scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I feel pretty good because all my friends are here helping me. But it is a very good sight to watch something go up that you work so hard for. What are you taking out of you know, personally everything? Or just, just personal belongings, anything that I can't replace. You know, dishes that you just can't replace it's been given to you, things like that. Clothes. You have other people helping you? Also. Yeah. My sister come up from Oregon to help me. What do the children think? Well, my two little girls I shipped to Anachi Monday night when this all started because they got scared right off the bat. Because they know what it can do. 5.15 p.m. Gusty winds shoot flames into the treetops. Now, no one can predict how quickly and in what direction the fire will run. Crews trying to hold a line above Ardenbore must be pulled back into town. fire picks up speed. Anxiety grows for men still on the lines. The Ardenbore Road is their only way out. No, uh, where'd she go and jump over the Mad River? No, it hasn't jumped mad yet, because the Mad River goes up this way, but there's nothing gonna stop it, I don't think. The way those winds are right now, she's going right up that bridge just as fast as it can go. <laughs> For one crew above the town, the pullback seems merely the routine ending of another long day. But unknown to them, fire has jumped the road ahead, generating heat and smoke on both sides. They start out totally unaware that for the next 90 seconds, they will run a choking gauntlet of smoke and flame. Yeah. <laughs> 
By six o'clock, all the men have been pulled back to safety. But high winds are blowing sparks and burning branches across the valley. The outlook is grim. 6.10 p.m. A summer cabin at the edge of town disappears within minutes, apparently touched off by a spark landing on the roof. Local firemen had watered it down less than half an hour before. Almost all of Ardenvoir's residents have decided to stay. They watch the approaching fire quietly, in a state of shocked disbelief. Six thirty. Facing the strong possibility of total disaster, Forest Service officials reach a desperate decision. From a watered-down line behind the row of homes, a backfire is started. Its purpose is to burn uphill to the oncoming fire and deny it further fuel. A risky procedure, but there is no acceptable alternative. Within half an hour, forest officials are certain the backfire will succeed. But to townspeople and firefighters alike, there is no sense of victory this night. In the backfire alone, 150,000 trees will die, many of them two to three hundred years old. The entire valley has been raked by fire, its natural beauty destroyed for at least a generation to come. August 28th, as the city fires still rage far through, professional crews, so-called hotshot teams, are sent into critical areas. These men come from Redding, California, and are led by 34-year-old Charlie Caldwell. Well, we've been on a total of 16 fires this summer, prior to the Mitchell Creek fire itself, and naturally the guys, uh, it's hard on them. As a hotshot crew, they do get some of the toughest and longest shifts on the fire line. This is what they're trained for, and we realize ahead of time that we're gonna be put in these positions. Hotshots are among the proudest firefighting crews of the country, and while sometimes called upon to perform heroic tasks,
their worth is often proved in more obscure and inaccessible reaches of the forest. Here they cut fire line with cool, relentless skill from dawn to dusk, day after day. Because of their training, men like these are rarely caught unaware by fire. Yet even they must pay a price. The end of each season leaves their lungs cruelly contaminated by dust and smoke. Charlie Caldwell has already been warned by doctors he must quit soon or face permanent damage. For others in his crew, fate will play even more cruelly. Within a few weeks, two of his men will die in an air crash while fighting fires in Southern California. this, the fifth day, more than 70 bulldozers are at work, battering out fire lines at the rate of half a mile every hour. And by now, thousands of men are laboring on the line. Some are drawn by a sense of adventure. Others feel impelled to defend land and forest dear to them. And many are here simply because with overtime, a man can earn as much as three to four hundred dollars a week. When did you guys first hear about the fire? Monday. We were on a small fire in our district and heard we were probably leaving that night, so we just got ready and left. When did you get out to this base camp? <coughs> I think Wednesday. We were in uh, Wenatchee for a day. Why are you fighting fires? For the money. Also, there's a little glamour in it. Not a whole lot. It's just sort of dirty, mean, rotten business once you get right down to it. The working day grows longer, sometimes 16 hours and more. Smoke, heat, and exhaustion take their toll. Minor injuries are more frequent. The chance of tragedy increases as fatigue saps alertness and caution. So by the morning of August 28th, the Forest Service needs reinforcements and has issued a call for volunteers. Six miles west of Ardenboa, a volunteer group comes on the lines. A few regulars are among them, but most are youngsters, untried and untrained. They have come to the ranger office in Leavenworth, Washington, and asked to fight fire. Their crew boss is well aware that he alone must assure their safety. You want to make damn sure that, that everybody realize this isn't just plain old kid stuff. Yeah, you can get your ass down here in a, in a hurry. And uh, so let's keep our guys together and don't let anybody want to run off someplace. If somebody gets sick, let's take care of them because you could get your butt burned. Okay. How far in do you want to burn? About 20, 30, 40 feet? Yeah, go out about 20, 30, 40 feet. And get her going good because we got suction from the other way now. And and if we take advantage of it, we might make it work. Okay. Turn this way. We aren't going to go on the other side. No, don't. Drop over on the other side. So, I'll see you to get back. If you need anything, holler on your radio. I'll be on the radio down here. Head up there, you guys. Normally, John Siegel would command a larger and more seasoned crew. But the situation is far from normal, and chance has given Siegel an unexpected opportunity. A steady wind now blows from the west. He may be able to backfire here and hold this line. Get with Frank and don't don't take you're not going with him. Okay, tell me who. Hey John, I'm gonna leave the radio with him crew. You better take it. We might have to get you out of there. 
Well, you're coming down this way, though. Okay. okay. Don't see my name. No, by golly, though. You know, you can look around at the crudas here, and you know, they're all young kids. Every damn one of them, and half of them don't know sick them, you know, to start with. But boy, they, they do a damn good job for oh, you, yeah. put them out there. They and got a little somebody that knows what they're doing with them. And them. they learn, and next year they come back, they're just twice as good, and next year, and we usually get them for about six years. Yeah. I've had the uh, same crew that I've got over to Leavenworth now for about four years. Yeah. And as they graduate, we pick up another one, and he'll go all the way through school. And, but the second year, he's real good. He get a lot of work out of his name. A lot of know-how. But the first year, uh, it's really rough. Within 15 minutes, the backfire surges to meet the major blaze, cutting off its possible line of advance. Wind conditions remain ideal. How fast can you go? How fast can I go? You been with the fire station me or not? <laughs> well, we came up there in about 15 minutes. Is this a summer job? Summer job. I'm a speech therapist. I'm going to be. I'm a senior next year. Yeah. Central, Washington State College. I don't everything's working good, huh? So far. So far. We got about another hour yet. I'll get Arden board getting some smoke now. Well. Look at the head on that thing. Hold on. Yeah. On this side of the mountain, it would take you a little bit. You bet. You cut one of them trees right there, and yeah. you'd probably cut it about 180 years, wouldn't you? What did you say, Mel? That took 200 years to build that thing and grow them trees. Now we're burning up in a half hour. <laughs> 32 miles away, Line boss Bob Boston surveys a disastrous new breakdown. Fire has suddenly swept into Black Canyon, a part of the forest that burned only 41 years ago. The new growth of prime young timber below has not even reached maturity. Boston will return with a grim report. Uh, he went down to one. Did it? Uh, yeah, I don't know. We've got two, two of our own packers, five callers. Five callers and, and, and two David's of them. David's on back yet. No. we got a whole new ball game. we got to fire her. Uh, Way out there. Way out there. There's fire right now, clear out to this ridge. Good grief. And if we get down to that Medhow Valley, well, this means farms and ranches and uh, orchards and fruit and cattle and everything else, right? Uh, private property, private homes. Uh, we're concerned in here, too, uh, with this burning out. We were talking this morning with uh, some of the fire behavior specialists, and we've got a loop on this end line, this opening here, and if we, uh, if we do uh, get the doggone thing tied together, uh, we're going to have to burn here under favorable conditions and burn in a little at a time to tie that, make that line safe. <laughs> the morning and early afternoon, an all-out effort is made to check the Black Canyon blaze. 
Around 3.30 p.m., men and machines are ordered back. In the following hours, 400,000 trees will be engulfed in flame and die. As with a battlefield defeat, when a forest dies, one man must be responsible and weigh the cost. The devastation of valuable timberland, a mortal blow to both beauty and economy, the risk of human lives, all are balanced and mourned by fire boss Don Peters. Don, how do you feel when you see fire go over a forest like this? Makes me sick inside. It's hard to say. I've been doing it a long time, but my whole career has been in forestry, and we want to raise the trees and use them. When they burn up, nobody likes to see treenery, trees or greenery burn. And the worst part of it is, you're concerned about men that are off in there, too, I mean, for safety. Maybe that's not the worst part of it, but that's one of our big concerns, because uh, we've got to know where our men are, and we've got to be prepared, and everybody has to be trained, and they have to follow orders. Well, I'll see you guys. Monday, August 31st. The fires are eight days old. Even while firefighting continues, crews mop up ravaged areas like Black Canyon. They must turn over every burning log, every inch of soil for smoldering embers. A single spark carried by the wind could ignite another holocaust. Mopping up is regarded by firefighters as perhaps the dirtiest and least desirable assignment on a fire. Yet, none argues its necessity, for a burned out forest is not easily forgotten. At Alter Lake Base Camp, Don Peters and his aides exude confidence for the first time since the fires began. They've had a break in the weather. The skies over the Mitchell Creek fire are clear. Reports from the field tell of a massive assault by the bombers. Though with some hesitation, Peters even talks of containment. We were in trouble, and I said, well, not to our knowledge. And I said, if it runs out the end, why, we're in trouble, and if not, why, we've maybe gone a long way to Wibbley.
On the Mitchell Creek fire, 95,000 gallons of fire retardant chemical will be dropped this day as the big air tankers hit one hot spot after another. Converted from their original use in another kind of war, they are flown by pilots who must risk their lives every day during a fire. On their attacks, small spotter planes often lead them in. The chemical they release is a fertilizer which clings to the trees and slows down the progress of fire. It is dyed red so the pilots can see where they've made their last drop. Afternoon, the bomber attack has had telling effect on the Mitchell Creek fire. Now the crews on the ground will try to close the line before dark. With greater protection now, the bulldozers make tremendous headway in carving line around the fire. In some cases, more than 50 yards wide. It is the beginning and ending irony of firefighting that to save the forest, you must destroy part of it. Five p.m. Nearly 60 miles of line, representing many long hours and days in the fire, are complete. The Mitchell Creek fire is surrounded. p.m. The news is brought to Don Peters at Alter Lake. How you doing, Dick? We tied the line in. Tied the, the line, line in. in. Oh, 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 boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Eight days. Eight days that we've been fighting her. Tied in. Run. Tied in. Run. 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 Tied in. Let's go in. After 12 more days, the last of the fires will be controlled. Wherever wildfire has come, what remains is only ruin. The forest primeval, virgin, silent, is now dead. It cost $13 million just to fight the fires. It will cost millions more to try to bring the forest back. But there is no true measuring of what has happened here. Only the sight of 118,000 acres of life now gone.
John Peters has spent a lifetime in the forests. In many respects, he has lived the life that Emerson and Thoreau prescribed for all mankind. In nature, he has sought tranquility. In living things, he has found beauty. In the trees, he has seen the qualities of all living beings. And so, the sense of loss cuts deep. In the scorched remnants of the soil can be read the story of a thousand years of growth, decimated within seconds. Animals in a wildfire are often burned beyond recognition. Some are caught in the terrible struggle to get away. This tiny squirrel apparently buried his head at that moment when he sensed he could not escape. What is left to Don Peters, now at the twilight of his career, is only a sense of sorrow, the knowledge of what a poet said nearly 2,000 years ago, that a forest is a long time growing. I hurt inside. I, I really feel badly because I'm 58 years old now, and uh, this area will not come back to where it was in my lifetime. There are just not that many years left that I have to live. <laughs> 